and welcome to DC Today. It is December the 12th on Tuesday and um, nice day in the market actually. We were a little quiet in the morning and then we ended up just sort of melting higher through most of the day and kind of built on gains and closed right at the high, at least in, in stocks, but uh, on the Dow, but both the NASDAQ and the S&P were also higher on the day. Uh, bonds were basically unchanged. The rates were down a little bit. The 10-year was down three basis points, closed at four, it put four, uh, 420 on the 10-year. So uh, big news of the day. There's really just one kind of data piece, um, which was CPI data. It was an inflation read that had been anticipated. And pretty much in, in line, we had um, a headline come in at 0.1% for the month and 3.1% year over year. And the big detractor outside of that, you probably guessed it, is energy coming down. So gasoline was down 6% inside of the, uh, inside of the headline number, uh, which, which, uh, which was good. All of that was basically right in line um, with expectations. Actually, on the month, I think that it was unchanged is what was expected, but basically the same. We're talking about 0.1%. Um, on core, we had a 0.3% uh, month over month change, uh, again, right in line with expectations. And then the year number, again, we're stripping out things like food and energy. So energy was the big pullback inside of the headline number. So core, the year over year number is still 4% on the year. So, so still a, a little sticky, I guess, year over year, but we've talked about this many times and I won't spend a lot of time today talking about it again. But inside of that, there's uh, an owner's equivalent rent number that's still at 6.8%. And, um, you know, we have numbers out just recently from the, you know, apartment national rent list that shows the numbers really negative 0.9% for the month. So we're using 6.8%. That's a third of what CPI is calculated from. And so if you think about that 4% number, it really is inflated because of housing. It's because of, it uses an average instead of what's happening in real life. Like if you look at the Zillow rent index or any of this stuff, it's definitely not showing that rents are growing at 6.8%. They're in fact declining. It was like 89 out of 100 cities that this list tracks were negative and 0.9%. Uh, so if you kind of bake all that in, you really do get an inflation number more like in the mid twos, which is right where they want to be. So um, I think they knew that because they're smart, of course. Um, but I think that they are, I think they're somewhat tethered to this worry about what happened in the 70s and having to stop and go again on interest rates. I don't know that it's a worry as much as everyone seems to write about it particularly. But, um, but yeah, I, I'm sure that they don't want to have to stop and then raise rates. But comparing this paradigm following a pandemic and just global indebtedness and a, you know, a globalized world and all these things to what was happening in the 70s and the 80s, I just think is a little, is a little, bit, um, a little bit off. I don't know that there's much correlation to those two time periods, especially given where unemployment is today at 3.7% versus where it was back then. Um, the, um, uh, tomorrow, you know, we had these, this inflation data today. It's timely. Tomorrow we get this, um, our FOMC meeting ends, the two day meeting ends tomorrow. So there'll be a rate decision tomorrow. They're going to leave rates unchanged. Um, definitely that they, they will. It'll be more focused on what the language is. Um, will they talk about the balance sheet? I wish they would. I, I don't know that they, they will, but I have a feeling in 2024 that that conversation will start to come up a little bit more. Um, maybe around the time in the March meeting, you know, maybe, you know, if you look at Fed futures right now, there's a like a 50-50 chance they're going to start cutting rights in uh, in May and something less than that in March. And uh, I, I believe that you, you may see something more of a language around the balance sheet runoff, quantitative tightening, maybe, you know, toning that down or, or, or stopping it depending. And then uh, following that, maybe a rate cut decision could come. Look, these things can change. So I, I'm not here to pretend there's a crystal ball. I'm just saying what, what Fed futures are priced in. And I'd be surprised if they were decreasing interest rates at the same time they were decreasing the size of their balance sheet. Those two things seem to, to work against one another. Um, I wrote a little piece today on, on a positive dynamic in the energy paradigm in, in the United States. We've written about this and frankly invested in this for many years. So this isn't new to us at TBG, but you know, post the Ukraine, Russia turmoil, you know, you really have seen a pretty dramatic shift in the EU's demand for heating, for natural gas particularly, come from places other than Russia. You know, the, 
you, you want to do business with friends, not foes. 68% of all uh, LNG exports from the United States for the month of November went to Europe, which is now overtaken um, uh, Asia as, uh, as the, the, the biggest destination for U.S. LNG exports. This is a good thing. It's, it, it, it helps with you know, budget deficits and trade imbalances. It helps with jobs. Um, it's a cleaner fuel to burn, you know, all those sorts of things. And um, I'm sure isn't what Putin necessarily wanted. Um, but, but there you have it. It's a, it's a benefit to us. And I, the analogy I wrote is just like the, you know, the pandemic really, and also just trade tensions between China and U.S. have really started to shift the global supply network, the supply chain network to places like Mexico and just other parts of the world, Vietnam, you know. And uh, th those types of changes are not something that happen overnight, but they're, and they're also not something that get undone overnight. So when you're talking about building infrastructure to ship liquefied natural gas to Europe, because that's, you know, they can buy it for as much or, or less uh, from a price perspective, but from a friend versus a foe, and then also supply chains moving around the world, you know, these are usually long-term uh, uh, paradigms that, that don't just move back overnight because uh, people get friendly all of a sudden. Or, or a war stops or something like that. So it's, it's impactful. Uh, tomorrow we have numbers out on uh, PPI, producer price index. And then of course, like I said, there's the Fed uh, meeting that will end. And then more importantly, it'll be the press conference that Powell gives. And then you know what kind of updates they give on the economic projections following that meeting. So that'll be interesting um, to watch. Other than that, David will be back with you on DC today, tomorrow. And then I will be back with you on Thursday. And uh, I appreciate you listening and reading. As always, I appreciate your questions, and I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.